Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. We are in a war. It's a popular mantra from government leaders at the moment, isn't it? Uh, I don't think there's many politicians who haven't referred to the pandemic in that way. Why so? Well, because it adds weight, doesn't it? Uh, it makes it clear how serious the situation is and, and justifies the extreme measures that are being taken. Now, we probably all have opinions and arguments uh, on how extreme those measures should be uh, or whether we should compare this situation to the horrors of war. Uh, certainly, Anzac Day reminds us that we can't make comparisons lightly and perhaps we shouldn't at all. But one thing cannot be denied. We are battling this virus. It is a fight. You know, there are soldiers on the front lines. There are leaders making decisions at the top. There are civilians feeling the tension uh, and the changes to everyday life. However, it's in such times as these that we need to remember that the virus is not the real enemy. As I mentioned last week, the, the pandemic is, like many other trials and crises in life, it is the context in which the real enemy gets to work. As Paul says in, uh, in Ephesians 6 here, uh, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And these dark forces love the fear and anxiety, the, the stress and the selfishness that develops in such crisis. Don't get me wrong, their power is very limited. They cannot author such a crisis, but they will capitalize on it by sowing fear and sowing selfishness where possible. So yes, there is a war going on, but it's not what we think. It's not a, a biological or, or medical or even economical war. It is, as always, a spiritual war. See, the virus is just a virus. You know, it doesn't think or plan or act. It's not a being of any sort. It, it's just another symptom of a broken world. But the real enemy will use such things to mislead us and to distract us and to delay us from our calling. The, the pandemic is simply a context for that. But thankfully, it, it's also the context for God's growth and transformation, uh, even more than the devil's schemes. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. But as well as being a context, uh, I think that this situation is also a great illustration. It's an illustration 
for us of the greater battle and war that we are a part of. And so this morning, what we're going to do is zoom in on half of our offensive within that war, uh, which is prayer. Last week, we considered standing firm in the gospel, considering the word, uh, as Paul calls it here, the sword of the spirit. And this week, we're looking at standing firm in prayer, which is the other uh, weapon we wield. So two points to consider today. First, the need for prayer. And second, the nature of prayer. That is, why do we need to pray and what does it actually look like? How do we do it? So firstly, the need or the necessity for prayer. And let me start by saying we can and should thank God that this pandemic is not even worse than it is. That it doesn't kill more ruthlessly, you know, without prejudice for age or other factors. That isn't, it isn't as destructive as the bubonic plague or smallpox or, or the Spanish flu, uh, horrible diseases in the past. But just imagine for a second that it was that bad. Imagine if this war, as we call it, was even more threatening. Imagine if we were all at risk of death. And then consider, well, what would you be doing in the face of it? Would you be watching the latest episode of The Bachelor? Playing perhaps a few games of Fortnite? Would you be checking the latest updates on Instagram? Maybe. But probably not. No, what you'd more likely be doing if you're a believer is reading the word and praying. Praying like crazy. Praying with with vigilance and alertness and and hyper-awareness and and a desperate dependence. Just like if you were in an actual war. Why? Well, because there'd be nothing else. Because we would all recognize and know our helplessness and mortality. And so we'd be crying out in humility. And that's how serious the real war is. In the face of the virus here in the West, you know, we still have our comforts. We have our cozy homes. Many of us have our health. Our health. Uh, and, And for most of us, the knowledge that we're going to be fine. But we can't say the same for the third world, can we? And we we can't say for the same for the whole world, spiritually speaking. Maybe you've joined us today and you can't say the same thing for yourself, spiritually speaking. So we need to pray. All of us to, to pray like our life depends on it. That's the point. Not just for ourselves, of course not, but for our city, for our country, for our world. We need to pray for those who are dying with coronavirus. But more so, we need to pray for those who are dying without Jesus. It's essential. It's a necessity. It's crucial. And so I just want to zoom in on two things here then about that need. And the first is that we need to pray because there is an enemy. And we can't fight it alone. There is an enemy, whether you believe it or not, the devil exists. Peter says to us in his letter, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. See, half the battle is acknowledging that there is an enemy in the first place, that there is a war going on around us. It's too easy to lean on our comfortable lives and just think that all is fine and, you know, hunky-dory. And again, the pandemic gives us an illustration here, doesn't it? I mean, at the very beginning of the situation, the greatest concern was that nations would deny the reality or deny the significance of this virus and pretend that, hey, it's not that bad, you know, it's not going to spread, it's probably not going to affect us too much, that kind of thing. And the fear was that such denial would make the situation so much worse, that it would spread quicker, that it would spread further, and that it would rob us even of the control that we do have. Just just chaotic. And so it goes spiritually. You know, denial of the enemy only makes the problem worse. 
pretending the threat doesn't exist or that, hey, it doesn't really affect me or that's, it's not about me, that only increases your risk. And for this spiritual threat, it, it doesn't matter if you're healthy or young or in a low category. There, there's no such thing. It, it can get anyone. As the old quote goes, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And how does he do that? Well, by using the world uh, and the self as, as cover. The, the world and the flesh. Jesus says when praying in the garden before his death, he says to his disciples, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The flesh is weak. Because whether in times of pandemic or in normal times, you know, we are our own worst enemy. Our hearts are corrupted and easily led astray. And of course, the world has so much to distract us, doesn't it? So much. Of course, one of the benefits in times of crisis is that those dazzling distractions are often revealed for what they are, empty. I read an interesting article a few weeks back which highlighted the empty response of rich celebrities who were trying to have a voice and encourage people in the absence of their performances uh, but really offering meaningless words as they you know, sat in their luxurious mansions away from the real problem. And in the same way that celebrity glamour must be revealed for what it is, so the thin layer of glamour around the West needs to be removed from our world and a light shone on the spiritual darkness that truly threatens. And that takes us from the negative side of this need to the more positive side, to the solution, the antidote. And that is how prayer paves the way for the revelation of the gospel. Allow me to jump to uh, verses 19 and 20 before covering verse 18 in the passage. Paul says, Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. That I will declare fearlessly and make known the mystery of the gospel. He says that very similarly in Colossians 4, which is worth reading. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. As I said, this is the antidote to the emptiness and the darkness that still threatens our world. It is the hope and life and promises of the gospel the mystery of eternity and the joy that's found in Jesus, that the perfect Son of God would die in our place so that we could be saved and we could be raised with Him, that is what we are ultimately praying for, that we will have that hope in our hearts and in the hearts of others. What is more important and more crucial than prayer when we consider this battle? I mean, seriously, I'm asking, is there anything else in life that that trumps this response, this faith act of praying? Whether in a crisis or not, we need to pray. We need to pray often because it is wartime, without a doubt. And if you're not a believer in prayer or in Jesus for that matter, consider what might be lying beneath the surface of our world. You know, a pandemic sort of peels back the facade only slightly. But what if you could see it all? Is it possible that that niggle of death points to a far greater need? And this is why Paul starts the passage with these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, back in verse 10. And it begins to highlight to us the nature of prayer. 
That prayer is a strengthening. It is a a standing, a leaning, a depending. Uh, He uses in the following verses the word stand four times. Uh, He says, take your stand, stand your ground, withstand, stand firm. And Peter says this as well after that earlier verse about the devil prowling around. He says, resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Prayer is about standing and withstanding, not in your own strength, not in yourself and your own might, but in the Lord and his power. I mean, doesn't the current crisis remind us that we can't lean on ourselves? We can't lean on our own understanding, as Proverbs 3 verse 6 says, but that we need to trust in the Lord. And it's important that I mention that prayer is part of the effort. It's not everything. I'm not here to try and say that this battle or that even this passage is all about prayer. There is, after all, six items of armour mentioned before this, uh, which we're not going to dive into today. But prayer is a significant and an essential part of the effort. When most of the armour is defensive, you wear it like that, uh, prayer is like the word. It's an active, offensive weapon. So how do we use it? How do we wield it? And fight with it. And that's where verse 18 uh, comes in. Paul says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And I just want to highlight two things from this verse before we finish. Uh, One is that we pray in the Spirit. And two is that we pray exhaustively. Now, in the past, Reformed folk have been quick to dismiss this kind of idea of praying in the Spirit as just a bit of charismatic lingo. But I believe that it's a mindset and it is an awareness that we must grow in, that we pray only in the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is a spiritual war after all. So we need the Spirit to help us to be our ally. Even more, we need the Spirit to be our prayer source, as Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8, which we're going to consider next week. That prayer is not just a head thing where we recite Scripture back to God or we communicate a list of wants and needs. And it's not even just a heart thing where we tell Him how we feel or how hard life is or how we're going, you know, and just have a chat. No, prayer is a spirit thing where we approach God by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit and are moved in him to greater adoration, greater confession, greater lament, thanksgiving, intercession, supplication, and more. The Spirit is there to alert us to the ongoing battle, to help us see beyond ourselves, beyond our own ignorance and to show us what we need to pray for and he even as paul says praise the things that we just can't clarify in our own hearts or minds the spirit moves us from the shallow stuff to the deep stuff opening our eyes broadening our scope and ultimately turning us to the father pray in the spirit And the Spirit does this exhaustively. Uh, In this verse, verse 18, there are four alls mentioned. All occasions, all prayers, all ways, or all perseverance, and all the saints. And our immediate reaction to such exhaustiveness is, that's impossible. who, Who can do prayer all the time? But again, I just want to say, We're not here to be distracted by the measuring or looking on our own strength. We are urged to understand the battle going on around us, to lean on the Spirit and to pray according to His strength. And so the alls are more of a goal than a law to help us, to urge us and encourage us. So all occasions, 
Uh, it doesn't mean every second of every day you've got to pray. It means all times or seasons or opportunity. So when creation moves us to praise, when sin moves us to confess, when pain moves us to lament, when grace moves us to gratitude, when needs move us to request, and when attacks move us to refuge. And aren't all of these things relevant today especially? To be moved into those kinds of prayers. And so it's also connected then to the types of prayers we pray. We could add to the list then. Uh, Individual prayers in intentional times of devotion. Individual prayers throughout your day when you turn your inner monologue towards God. Corporate prayers in your family, in your small group, in one-to-one catch-ups, in whatever gathering we have. Or corporate prayers through song and scripture and giving and fellowship as when we gather for worship. For example, we've got another prayer meeting tonight and it is exactly the kind of opportunity that Paul urges. We can all be a part of that. We can all join in and pray together uh, in this urgent time. And then there is all ways or all perseverance and endurance. Because it's the way that we get through crises, being vigilant, alert and aware, praying as we actively seek God's will in the situation. So pray because this crisis reminds us of a greater spiritual crisis. Pray because this world is not going to go on forever. Pray because many people can still meet Jesus. And pray because the present will give way to the future. And to eternity. And that matters to everyone. And finally, pray for all God's people. For the world, yes, but also for the church. The battle lives in all of us. It is felt and fought in many different ways. But we are in it as God's church together. Which means we should pray for each other's hearts and souls and families and even each other's awareness. We should pray for for each other and with each other too, because we know what this war is, and when we know who the real enemy is, and we know the gospel, that is the solution. And we should pray because we're called to be on the front line. Like the healthcare workers in this pandemic, we are the ones called to go forth and battle the virus of darkness, if you will, in in God's strength, by the Spirit's power and working, and of course in the name of Jesus and his gospel. So what occasions can you add prayer to in your life? What kinds of prayer have perhaps been missing that you can bring in to your walk with God? How can you pray in order to help you persevere and to press on? And who can you pray for going forward? Who can you pray might be saved in this time? Who can you pray might be strengthened in this time? Prayer is one of the easiest things that we can do. It's hard, yes, because it's not natural. It's hard at times because we're not prone to it, but it's so easy to just stop and pray. So why don't we do that now? Just, um, I'll close in prayer, but maybe just take one minute or so to pray to God in this time uh, of war, in this time uh, where he is shining his light in the darkness. Let's pray.
Father, we ask you this morning that you would open our eyes to see the world around us in light of who you are, in light of your gospel, in light of the spiritual reality that's going on around us. Lord, we can't see it with our eyes, but we ask that you help us to see it by faith and by the Spirit's working. And in seeing that, Lord, in considering the bigger picture, the greater need, the real battle that's going on, help us to pray, to be moved, to depend on you fully, and to plead with you for this world, for our church and for ourselves, that you would continue to show your grace and your mercy, to protect, to intervene, to rescue, to pull people out of the darkness and into the light. And Lord, to use this this challenging time to bring transformation. We pray these things in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit's power who dwells within us and equips us and sends us into your world. We pray that the Spirit will embolden us and move us to pray more and more. Amen.